Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Bootleg, a Tennessee and high school football show where we talk all things high school football here in Tennessee. The show is presented by Farm Bureau Health Plans. We thank them for their support. Without them, we cannot do shows like this. The entire cast of characters are here. I'm your host, Tom Crager, with the Tennessean. And it and, and looks like even Buddy the Bunny has made a return to the show, at least according to Aaron's um, name tag. Buddy, is the bunny here? He is currently under the couch. Okay. Maybe he'll make an appearance, folks. I know uh, he is a favorite character uh, for a lot of the viewers. Uh, so we're going to go right into it. We are, Guys, we are one step closer to Cookville. The road has started, and we are in round two of the playoffs. Actually, round one or the quarterfinals for Division II AAA. Their postseason starts this Friday. And, folks, uh, we're going to start. we got three topics. Uh, we're going to go over them. Uh, we're going to talk about the big surprise from round one, an upset alert for round two, and where are they? Where are we going in round two of the playoffs? We're going to start with the big surprise. Joe Spears, what was your big surprise from the first round of the playoffs? Um, I, I feel like we should let Aaron talk about Pal because I mean that was the the biggest surprise of the weekend or of Friday. Um, I, I was kind of looking over the scores, and I think one that really caught my eye, honestly, was Mount Juliet beating uh, Warren County. Uh, that that was a game that really was kind of a defensive slugfest. I mean, Mount Juliet really, C.J. Taylor did his thing, 197 yards and two touchdowns, but Warren County didn't complete any passes. He actually threw an interception, and Mount Juliet did just enough to beat a Warren County team that looked really good against Oakland. So that that kind of shocked me when I saw that score. Now Mount Juliet gets to take on, a, take on Oakland, who a lot of us have going on to win state. So... That was a good one. Then my game was, uh, I honestly, I thought that was kind of a shocker. I thought Gallatin would pick up the win and Columbia comes back and wins it in triple overtime. So I think those two games in particular, outside of the Powell game, really caught my eye. That was the game I thought you were going to actually talk about was the Columbia game in that weird haze, winning in, in triple overtime on the road at Gallatin. You know, they've struggled. They kind of had to work their way, back door their way into the playoffs. And can you tell me a little bit more? I mean, that was to me is one of the big surprises for me was Columbia. Yeah, I think I mean that was it was just a great game overall. Columbia scores the game tying touchdown with just over four minutes remaining. Um, Gallatin misses the game winning field goal at the end, kind of just goes wide right, and then in the first overtime, you think Columbia blows it by throwing an interception, only to have Gallatin botch a field goal attempt and. Columbia ends up going on to win it in triple overtime. Brady McCandless had a really good game uh, considering this offense had struggled a lot in recent weeks. So um, they got a, they, they, they needed that win. Obviously they got it. It was a really emotional win for them. And uh, they, it was a re- compared to the last couple of weeks. I think they, uh, they've got a little bit of momentum now and they need it, especially going against summit on Friday. Since we know we're going to talk about it, let's just go straight to uh Aaron Torres, the big surprise. Uh, I'm guessing you're going to go with the uh, Powell and Walker Valley. Yes. I mean, Powell, I thought, was one of the favorites for the state championship in Class 5A. They blew out Central in earlier in the season. They beat Beach in Week 1. Um, and then they got held to a season low 16 points, and it's lost to Walker Valley in the first round of the playoffs. Um, I didn't expect that happening. I think a lot of us were, um, at least here in East Tennessee, we were expecting for West to play Powell again in the second round of the playoffs. And the winner of that game likely would have been the front runner for the state championship. Um, but with Powell losing, I mean, that just, no one was expecting that. Um, at least here in East Tennessee. I don't know about the rest of the state. You look at Powell, we've talked about this at, at, at nauseum on our little chats we have amongst each other. You know, Powell finished the season three out of four losses. Um, you know, that upset loss to Oak Ridge also is alarm. You know, that was maybe that that kind of should have maybe that was a warning for us um, that this team wasn't invincible. I think everyone thought maybe the West game 
wasn't that big a deal just because, I mean, we knew how, how good West was. But um, they're losing three out of four, but they have a lot of people coming back, do they not? Aaron, I know the quarterback was, was young. They have a lot of people coming back um, on the offensive side of the ball. Jordan Potts, he's only a sophomore. Their top receivers are underclassmen. Um, their running backs were two seniors, Jordan Brown um, and Fernando Francis. They were both seniors. And Jordan Brown also played linebacker. He was probably their best linebacker. Um, so they do have a lot of people coming back on the offensive side of the ball. And also on the defensive side of the ball, they have a good amount of young defensive backs as well. Um, I mean, they have Darius Redman, who is the best player, I think the second best player at his position for the class of 2023. He's a wide receiver um, who already has several SEC offers. So they'll be good for a while. Um, I just thought that they would go a lot farther um, than they did at least last season. Last season, they made the quarterfinals in class 5A. I thought this year they would at least uh, make it to either the quarterfinals, the semifinals, or the state championship game. Kari Thompson, what was the surprise for you uh, in Memphis? Uh, I would say, uh, well, it's not in Memphis, it's more on the fringe, but I would say that my big surprise would be Brighton making it further than uh, Covington did in Tifton County. Um, I mean, making it further than Munford did in Tifton County. Um, Munford lost the first round to Clark, Clark Field, that was 16 to 14. Um, obviously, close game. Cougars couldn't pull it out. Um, Brighton gets the upset win on their side of the bracket. So, um, I, if you would have asked me uh, who would have made it further between those two, I would definitely tell you Michael. Michael Odom. I could easily go with the upset special I gave last week with Crockett County beating Fayette Ware, but since I picked it, I'm not going to call that as my what surprised me the most. Uh, I'm actually going to go Middle Tennessee here. And Jackson Christian beating Friendship Christian in the fashion they did, 45 to 35, uh, with Aaron Smith throwing for a program record 511 passing yards. Uh, that's the second time these two teams have met. The first time was in the 2006 state championship that Jackson Christian also won. Uh, Jackson Christian was on a three-game losing streak going into that game. Uh, they, the offense just wasn't working right, but obviously, if you could throw for 5'11", uh, had a receiver break a program record with 254 receiving yards, uh, I think that was a, a big uh, surprise for me. George, I bet we're going back down to Munford. Well, um, you could you could say that, yeah. Uh, that certainly was a was a shocker for me. Just you know, the fact that Clarksville maybe a month ago was didn't look like they were even going to get into the playoffs. Um, but I have to say, I know that Stewart County, uh, the Stewart County Stratford game really shocked me just in the in the way that Stewart County won the game. Uh, they were completely out of it by, um, you know, by that fourth quarter. They were they were down two two scores with with just a little bit over a minute left. And the way that they were able to come back and win that game. Now, there was a little bit of controversy um, on the onside kick, I think, you know, people, you know, certainly a lot of people were, were you know, tweeting out um, how, I guess, uh, how wrong those officials were for calling that, uh, you know, for calling that possession for uh, for Stewart County being able to to get that onside kick. Um, you know, I was sat there and wa I watched it all weekend. I, I, re I tried to slow it down. I tried to pause it at certain points. Um, it looked like to me that the kid was able to corral the ball with one foot up off the uh, off the ground and one foot inbounds, and um, I think maybe that was what you know the official saw. Uh, I'm not gonna you know I'm, I'm certainly not putting any words in the official's mouth, but I think if you look at it from that standpoint, you know obviously I know Stratford was devastated after that loss, and and you know they played well enough to win. It's just you know Stewart the the manner in which Stewart County fought back and won that game uh, was surprising to me uh, because in that situation you don't really see a lot of teams in the in, in, in even in the playoffs being able to pull out 
uh, a, a game down two scores with with just over a minute left in the game. I would have loved. I mean, I think everyone was citing your video footage from that. You were right on there. I only wish we could have seen video from the opposite direction oh, yeah. because yeah. there you could have seen did he have the ball? It was he possession. did he have it in his possession? Was he bobbling? All that's the only thing I think. Right. And I will say this: um, give Thomas Porter, the coach at Stratford, credit. Uh, he, someone pointed out from from his his team or staff or so, a Stratford fan. Someone pointed it out to him, and and, and basically he said, "Hey, you, you can't put yourself in that position where that could lose the game for you." Yep. Uh, so hats off to to Thomas Porter. From I know it was a very frustrating night. I kind of exchanged a text message with him. I know he was very frustrated, but he took the high road. And, and you know, and, and you know, it's one thing my dad has always told me as a kid growing up: don't blame the refs. Don't put yourself in position. For a ref to, to lose a game for you, so uh, uh, Absolutely. We, we, I think we can all learn learn from that. Uh, Cecil Joyce, what was your surprise? Rutherford County had no surprises on the night. I mean, I picked one upset that didn't happen with Blackman not beating Hendersonville, but you can't really be surprised when an upset you picked didn't happen. So scouring the brackets, I think it might be the only four one upset that I remember seeing was uh, Pigeon Forge in three A not only defeating Claiborne County number one seed, but the fashion in which they did that, 42 to 14. Uh, I don't know how, I don't know much about those two teams, so I don't know how big of an upset, but anytime a four beats a one, 42 to 14, you have to consider that a pretty huge upset. Upset that didn't happen. I'll tell you a surprise. I'm not gonna call it an upset because it wasn't an upset. A surprise to me was the game I was at where Brentwood 45, Cane Ridge 13, and the reason why it's an upset is, folk, or, or a surprise. I'm, I'm, again, I'm not going to call it an upset. I, I did pick Cambridge to win that game. But Brentwood had 34 players out of that game due to contact tracing for all, all the COVID that has hit uh, Brentwood High. Um, you know, to, to not have – I think they were without nine starters. Uh, they didn't have – their best defensive back in John House the fourth. He was out with a foot injury. Their tight end, uh, they lost the tight end like the day before the game. Uh, their quarterback, you know, one of their top three players, Kate Granzo, he goes out on the third offensive snap uh, for, for Brentwood uh, in, in, with a knee injury, or, or I guess it's a knee sprain, maybe a MCL sprain or strain or whatever they're calling it. But, um, uh, you know, for them to win so convincingly, and, and Davis White throws for five touchdowns and threw it all over the place against a very talented and athletic Cane Ridge team that just really, uh, to me, needed a 10 game season. I think that's a team that really, I mean, they had talent on that team. If they would have had a normal, normal year, I think they would have been played much, much better. So um, that's my surprise of not so much that they won, even though I did pick them to lose was just the convincing fashion with so many players. I mean, he had freshmen, a guy who played some varsity the week before, just in some mop-up duty, catch a touchdown. Uh, you had, you know, the quarterback that came in and had practiced all week as a receiver because they were so depleted. And then he steps in and, and, you know, he was their backup all year, but he steps in, does a great job. So that's my surprise of, uh, of the first round of the playoffs. Upset alert. Who is going to be on the upset alert in round two of the playoffs? We're going to start uh, with Aaron Torres. You got bu rubbing bu Buddy for good luck. And for this pick here, who do you got? Who's the upset? Uh, an easy one could be Hall's upsetting Central. Mistake last year, I don't want to hear from Caleb Fortner at Central if they win because he'll probably text me at midnight after the game. Um, so I'm going to go with Pigeon Forge over Gatlinburg Pittman as an upset alert. Pigeon Forge already beat Claiborne last week, as Cecil mentioned, a four over a one. Um, Pigeon Forge has had a really great season. I mean, they were one in nine in 2018 and 2019. Um, Scott Meadows, who's the coach there right now, he was at Carter last year, resigned after one season at Carter, came back to Pigeon Forge, and led them to a playoff victory last week for the first time since 2015. And so if Pigeon Forge can beat Gatlinburg Pittman, then it'll be the first time in school history that Pigeon Forge is in the quarterfinals. And in the regular season, Pigeon Forge only lost to Gatlinburg Pittman 15 to 12. So it's not inconceivable. 
Yeah, I was looking through the schedule, and I've actually talked to Odom about this, and I think one game that really caught my eye was South Gibson Westview. Uh, Westview's really, they've played well at times this year, but against top-tier teams like Covington and Milan, uh, they got blown out in those games. They also lost to South Gibson 26-19 when they played them earlier in the season, but they they made a big comeback in that game. I, I just feel like Ty Simpson's do a big postseason performance at some at some time against a really good team uh the what's gonna matter here is if westview's defense can slow down south gibson's uh option offense and not a lot of people have been able to do that south gibson's played really well this year so i don't know i just feel like westview at some points do a big postseason performance and i feel like they could do that against a south gibson team that they they played close already this season Kari thompson what's your what's your upset alert either in memphis or looking at the statewide brackets I'm putting father ryan on upset alert they're playing mus i got mus coming to nashville and getting that win mus on a five game winning streak they have very good defense they got a you know a couple d1 caliber linebackers in DJ Brown and uh, Roderick Lewis, um, they have they, they have an SEC commitment in uh, in Gavin McKay. Um, they have an offense that's been figuring things out all year, but has been doing better lately down the stretch. Um, it's a team that started out, you know, zero and two, but uh, but but has come back with a vengeance. So I'm picking the Owls, man. I know Tom shaking his head. Why are you shaking your head, Tom? You, I hope you realize we have a very strong Father Ryan fan base that listens and watches the bootleg religiously. Co uh, folks, that is Kari Thompson from the Commercial Appeal. Have at it. Uh, DC Tapscott is not going down in the first round of the playoffs. They played too well. But hey, I, I respect your, your. I mean, they they beat. Uh, uh, who, they beat uh, Pope John Paul. You know, in the in the in the regular season. So hey, things can happen in the postseason. Not this one. Uh, who we got left here? Uh, Michael Odom. You got an upset? I do. I want to talk a minute about Springfield. They have been the thorn in West Tennessee side for four years now. In the postseason, Springfield is 12 and 1 against West Tennessee teams through the 4A playoffs. It is going to end this Friday night. Hardin County is going to go to Springfield and get the win. Uh, Hardin County is such a balanced offensive attack with quarterback Rivers Hunt, uh, with receivers Caden Pope, Seth Garner, a great running back in John Whitley, who was not healthy last year when they played. I, I think Hardin County goes up to Springfield and picks up the upset. That's a wonderful pick, but I just want to point out, as strong as a fan base that Father Ryan has, Springfield has got a great fan base on the bootleg. They love the show, and, and folks, that is Michael Odom of the Jackson Sun. But uh, no, that's actually a good pick. I mean, I mean, they are without Hudson Wolf, and uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. I think that that's going to be a great game there in Springfield. Dustin Wilson's done a great job. Uh, George Robinson, what you got? Um. Well, first of all, Kari's way in Memphis, so he's protected. He's fine. He's in Shelby County. He, that's three hours away from Nashville. He, has, he ain't got to worry about the Father Ryan people. He's hunkered down, you know? <laughs> um, Michael actually kind of he's, – he sort of stole my thunder a little bit, but I don't know if um, – you know, I felt like Hardin County was probably um, one of the favorites to get to the – to the state championship, um, you know, in, in that class, in, in class 4A. Um, and so I was sort of swinging the other way, the opposite direction of, of Michael in, in, in that I felt like maybe Springfield, you know, with that record that they have in, in uh, you know, in teams against West Tennessee um, or teams in West Tennessee uh, would, you know, could possibly pull this one out. I, you know, I, like Michael said, Hardin County so balanced, um, you know, but Springfield's been playing well, you know, just all year long. And, you know, I'm so impressed with uh, with how they run their offense. Um, you know, defensively, they can give up some points, uh, but offensively, those, they're so multiple uh, in, in what they can do. Um, you really can't get a bead on them in, in terms of uh, whether or not the, you, you know they're a run heavy team or a pass heavy team they seem to be able to do both of them pretty uh you know pretty well so i think they're balanced 
like Hardin County in that sense. Um, so, so I kind of like, you know, I don't know necessarily that it's that it would necessarily be the the, the uh, upset because I think, you know, you can go through all six classifications and kind of scour through and see what, you know, what teams would be on upset alert. I, I kind of looked at uh, South Pitt and, and maybe thought maybe Monterey could could pull off uh, maybe a huge, huge second round upset there. But, you know, in the end, be, you know, because Hardin County has been playing so well and because this is probably one of the best matchups, second round matchups in the state. Um, I, I kind of want to go uh, kind of leaning towards Springfield. And also because, you know, like you said, Springfield's got a ton of people watching this bootleg and I often do care, a cover of Springfield. So I don't want to have any, I want to have any <laughs> in, in, in Robertson County. All right, see, so what you have? Michael Odom, my middle Tennessee Christian school, Division II single-A Cougars are coming down to Jackson, and they are going to pull off the Division II upset of the week. Aiden Hooper missed the team's last game of the season. They were off this past week in the first round. They had a COVID win. Hooper threw two, eight touchdowns in his final two games he's played. He's got 16 touchdowns in the year, over 1,600 yards, over 1,300 yards passing. Their offense is averaging 39 points in their last four games. During those last four games, USJ has not played. I know it's good to have a little time off sometimes when we haven't played in what's what we've going on a month when this game is played. Uh, I think Middle Tennessee Christian School is sharp. I think they're playing their best football right now. Uh, I think they're going to put up the points. It's going to be a high scoring game, but I think they're going to outscore USJ and pull off the upset. I looked at three different games, folks. I thought Trousdale over Bledsoe. Then I thought that's probably not big enough upset. Y'all expect bigger for me. Uh, then I thought Creekwood over Lexington, and I thought, man, that, that would be a huge upset, but that's on the road. I just don't know if that's going to happen. So the one I have finished on, the one I'm going with, book it 100%. It's going to happen somehow. Hillsboro is going to drive up to Beach, where they lost 14-7, to and beat Beach, a team that many consider a, a semifinalist or a finalist or even a state champion. And Hillsboro is going to beat Beach and be one of two Metro football teams left in the playoffs. Uh, book it. Sorry, Cecil. I think that was your favorite. That was your team to win it. No, I, that is. But so you're definitely yeah. going out on a limb on this. Well, it's not it was 14, up there. I think it was 14 nothing or 14 7, the first meeting. Uh, I think they're going to figure it out because that was only their second or third. I think it was their second game of the year. So I think uh, Coach Maurice. Fitzgerald has got them rolling. And next, last point is where are you going to be at? Uh, where is your game of the week? Aaron Torres, tell me where you're at and tell me who's going to win and a score. I'm going to be at Anderson County versus Greenville. It's at Anderson County. Uh, fourth straight year that they're playing in the playoffs. Greenville has won the previous three straight games. Um, last year, they won 24-7 to in the second round. I have Anderson County winning 28-25. Um, I think this is the year Anderson County finally gets past Greenville. Um, so Anderson County is currently on a seven-game winning streak. They've scored at least 42 points in, those, in that winning streak. Um, I think this is finally the year Anderson County can get it done. Aaron, make sure you leave Buddy at home because we don't know if Ella likes bunnies. Ella, of course, is the dog that retrieves the, the kicking tee at Anderson County game. So you might want to leave Buddy at home for this week. All right. Want to protect her. All right. Uh, Joe Spears. Uh, I'll be at the rematch between Summit and Ga uh, Columbia. Um, these two teams played early in the year, and Summit really had no issues in that game, winning 35-0. Um, they held Columbia to 134 total yards of offense and forced three turnovers out of them. Destin Wade really didn't have to throw the ball. He ran for 121 yards and four touchdowns. Um, I think Columbia can make this a bit of a game early. I mean, they're going to be, um, they have some momentum from that win on Friday against Gallatin, but no word on if Keaton Wade is going to be playing in this one. Um, I'm not sure they really need him, need him for this. They didn't the last time these two teams played. Um, Summit looked really good last week. Granted, they were playing a team that they uh, many of us projected they would blow out. They went 42-6. to six. 
Um, and Summit's just really playing great football, um, despite the fact that they haven't played a whole a ton in the recent month. But um, I think Summit cruises to a 42 to 13 win here. Um, and yeah, and if if you're saying what you're saying, Tom, they'll, they won't be playing beach next week. We'll see what happens there. And, and it's good to see them back on the field. First game since like October 8th, I think. And uh, yeah. be interesting to see if they can get Keaton on the on the field sometime soon so they can get some rust knocked off uh, since he's really played virtually nothing. Um, uh, Kari Thompson, what do we got? We'll be at Christian Brothers. Um, anytime you got the defending state champs coming to town, I think you should take that opportunity and go see them. Mm-hmm. I think that uh, when you have two of the best uh, players in D2 AAA and BJ Harris and Dallin Hayden, I think you need to go see that battle between the running backs. You got two of the five Mr. Football semifinalists on the field. So I'm looking forward to seeing that one. I got Christian Brothers pulling it out 28 to 21. Michael Odom. I will be at Johnny Hill Stadium as Milan, the number one seed from 7-3A, host the number three seed Covington. Covington has made the semifinals the last three straight years. Two of them, they went on to play for a state title. Uh, Milan is the region champion this year. They beat them last year, but can they beat them in the postseason? That's the big question. Yeah, and what's your score on that? I'm sorry. Uh, 21-17 Milan. Okay. George, uh, I will be at Northeast Clarksville and Northeast. That's the uh, Region Seven Five A uh, matchup uh, between those two region teams. It's the first time in a decade that uh, two teams from Clarksville have played each other in the playoffs. Um, you know, obviously this is the second round, uh, a second round playoff game. Northeast didn't play last week because um, you know I, Memphis Memphis Public Schools uh, didn't participate in the in the season so that gave northeast a bye this week and and they get clarksville that upset munford uh like harry was talking about earlier upset munford last week uh you know to make it to the second round so uh somebody from clarksville is going to be in the quarterfinals <laughs> and so that hasn't happened since northeast did it in 2013 of course that team was led by uh jalen reeves maven went on to play at ut and is now with the detroit lions so um you know this game has a has multiple kind of angles to it. Uh, Northeast has already beat Clarksville this year, beat them 44 to 14 on on October 2nd. Um, Jawan Harris, the Northeast running back, just absolutely ran wild in that game. I think he had 187 yards rushing, a couple of touchdowns. He had 140 yards in just the third quarter, um, in in um, or uh, the second quarter had 140 yards in the second quarter. I think he had a like over 160 yards by halftime. So uh, he ran up and down the field last time these two teams met. Uh, but that was the last time uh, Clarksville lost. Since then, you know, Clarksville's uh, been on a four game win streak. Uh, they put themselves in a position to be in the playoffs. And uh, like I said, got that win last week. So I think this is a, this will be a little bit of a different game. I still think Northeast pulls it out and uh, they win 28-24. Uh, and then they'll probably face Henry County next week in the quarterfinals, and it's probably going to be over by, by that point. Diesel Joyce? I'll be at Oakland High School, where Mount Juliet will come into town. Third straight year, the two teams have played each other in the playoffs, and they've been remarkably close, at least to Oakland playoff standards. Uh, two years ago, Oakland slipped by Mount Juliet 14 7 in the uh, quarterfinals. Last year, uh, Oakland won 24 to 14 in the second round, and what really was a lot closer game than folks expected then. I don't think this year is going to be that close. This isn't the same Mount Juliet team. Uh, they they had to slip past Warren County last week. Oakland's playing as well as they have all year. Their offense is rolling. They've got uh, two great running backs in Jordan James and Antonio Patterson. The defense is playing a lot better. Uh, I don't see Mount Juliet posing a, a huge threat, despite uh, Stork Montgomery thinking that I'm. For my hometown team, I just think it's going to be Oakland all the way. I'm going 35 to 14 Patriots. Cecil can't win. You can't lose this week. You got you got your alma mater playing the team you cover, so you can't win. You can't lose. I guess you can't win either. So uh, uh, I will be in in Nashville. I'll be at uh, East Nashville at Pearl Cone, where East Nashville four and one travels to Pearl Cone six and zero. Oh. 
uh, rematch of their week two, which is, I don't know, week six or seven, somewhere, week six, I guess, maybe, uh, meeting uh, where where it was really close for a half, and then Pearl Cone kind of exploded, uh, beat them 42 to 21. It's my first chance to see both teams, so it's one of the reasons, one of the reasons why I wanted to see this. Uh, Pearl is kind of, you know, they didn't get a chance to play last week. Camden pulled out late uh, due to COVID. Um, but I think it's an interesting matchup. You got Jamal Stewart playing and coaching East Nashville in his biggest game as a first-year head coach. Uh, and I like uh, I like Pearl to win this game. They won 42-21 the first time. I think it's a little bit closer, but I do think it's 49-28. to to I'm sorry, uh, 49-28. I guess it's the same spread, but I think um, – Again, it's going to be a late score that maybe pushes it over there. And I think uh, uh, whoever wins this game should make it to the semifinals. Um, nothing due res- all due respect to Giles and to Stuart County. I just think these are the top two teams left in that quadrant. So whoever wins this game, probably going down to Michael Odom country in the semifinals. That's it. That's all we have. Uh, it's Tuesday afternoon. We are recording this. So far right now, there has been no game that I know of that has been canceled to COVID. So maybe that's a good sign going into the playoffs. Although the cases around the state are exploding at uh, alarming rates. So folks, please mask up. Please social distance. Uh, If you have any symptoms, please get tested and uh, stay away from everyone if you have symptoms. So we can get through the the playoffs uh, as we try to figure out a way to get to Cookville. Uh, You've been watching The Bootleg, presented by Farm Bureau Health Plans. We'll see you next week where we, as as Team Tennessee, will break down what happened in week two of the playoffs, and we'll look forward to the quarterfinals of Division I and semifinals of Division II. Until then, we'll see you later.